a little. Last night in my, in my, my dreams, God's been showing me all kinds of great things that are coming. But I heard in my dream, and this is just let me give you some understanding. When you hear something that's negative, God wants you to pray about it. And I heard in my dream, I heard this screaming, this blood curdling scream. This woman is just screaming because she's so frightened. Oh, it was so, it gripped my heart so right out of sleep. I says, God, visit her, touch her right now. Go right there and touch her. Don't let her cry like that. And God did that. I don't know how he did it, but all of us in this great big peace. And I could see her face, and I could just see peace coming over right now. You know, and things, God wants you to be able to respond like that. It might scare you sometime, but I tell you, you know, um, God needs us to pray, and he needs us to ask. Remember, most prayer, not all of it, but a lot of prayer is asking God to get involved with someone. Do you understand? A lot of people don't know to pray. Somebody prayed for me. Look what happened. (laughs) Amen. Amen. So praying and talking. Now, prayer is not contemplating and thinking. Prayer is actually pouring words and talking because it takes an effort. It doesn't take an effort to think. Well, maybe for some of us. to land on good ground the condition of our heart is good ground so to receive the word of God and that it can produce 30 60 and 100 fold with patience and Lord God we receive the word of God the Holy Spirit is here to administer to it to open the eyes of our understanding and father help us to walk us through the truths of the word so we can see the victories, souls saved, and people's lives touched. And all that agree, would everyone say? Amen. Now, folks, there's a lot of things out there where it causes Christians not to trust. And right now, the enemy's working overtime to break trust in believers. Not trusting church, not trusting each other, these kind of things. Avoid that at all costs. Say amen. I, I, Linda and I always invited you to get to know us. You want to know what we're all about? Get to know us. Take us out to lunch and, and get into our head and ask us some questions if you want. Don't be sitting around and having all this good stuff and wondering if Pastor Kerry's saved or not. <laughs> you know that by now. All right. We've been doing a lovely study called the New Creation Realities. Are you with me? We're going to call this one called Created for good works. So the subtitle of it is Created for Good Works, the New Creation Reality Series. Eventually, there'll be 50 Bible studies that you'll be able to take home, these outlines, and share with your neighbors or with your family. And that's the reason why I put things down on notes. You can order these notes, see my wife. But the idea is so that you can share the word. The Bible says, when Paul writes to Timothy, He says, teach people who can teach others also. You see, you know, don't just share the word of God to people who are not going to take it and teach others the same thing. Make disciples. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, right, and make disciples. All right, so greetings in the morning, greetings in the evening, and when the sun goes down, hope you're greeting God. We're going to be studying about created for good works. God is now living in our heart. And how many know that everything God does is perfect and good? But see, having God live in our heart, we have to yield to him. We need to allow him to guide our steps to do good works. Do you believe that? Amen. So we're going to turn around and look at our scripture. 
This is Matthew chapter 5. I am a firm believer in prayer and intercession. And we're going to be from time to time giving more of the mysteries of, of what prayer is about, how to do it properly. You know, prayer is good. It's conversation with God. But there's some things that the enemy's got in and tricked a lot of prayer warriors. Okay. So look what this says. Is, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Your what? Folks, you are to be known by your good works. Your testimony to God, yes, but the good works that you do for his glory, that you may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. So go with me to Galatians chapter 5, please. We're going to look at verse 16 through 20. Let me know when you get there. I, I love this. Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 20. Now, when you hear the term walk in the spirit, you need to look at the word spirit. See if it's a capital S or a small s. Now, if it would be a small s, what spirit are they talking about? Your spirit. Okay. And when they talk about a big S, they're talking about the Holy Spirit. God wants us to be able to walk every day in the Holy Spirit. He set, it up, set us up that, so we could, but Satan gives religion so we can't. Oh, God doesn't want me walking in the Spirit every day. Nobody can do that. Yes, they can. You got God in you. Don't forget about the God in you part. That's the one who does it. You're along for the ride. Hello? All right, so we'll move right along. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, lusts or desires. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit, capital S, against the flesh. These are what? Contrary, folks, to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Quickly stop. James talks about a double-minded man. I teach this. I haven't heard anybody else teach this, so I think God gave me this to teach. You are a type of Cain and Abel. What did Cain do to Abel? He, he murdered him. What did Cain do? Why was his sacrifice not accepted? Because he did it his way. Sounds like the flesh to me. And Abel followed it God's way. Now forget about the murder, okay? Let's look at the situation. Your flesh is always going to want to do it your way. So you have to present it to God so God can get to working with it. Amen. We're to be crucified, but nevertheless alive, but live from the inside out. We used to walk from the outside in. Now we walk from the inside out. So we're a type of Cain Abel. Our Abel is our spirit and our soul inside of us trying to follow God. And our flesh is the Cain. Now, isn't it sad, Romans chapter 7, when Paul is talking about his life as a Pharisee, he said, when I want to do good, evil is present with me. Now you know what he was talking about. I, ha I want to do good in my spirit, man, but my flesh is always talking me out of it. <laughs> Come on. Now, you may not be that way now, but, you know, when we first started, it seemed like there was two of us, old and new man. Can you say amen? Now, let's go on and re continue to read. But if you are led by the Spirit, everyone say led by the Spirit. That means that from your heart you follow what God tells you. From your heart, not your head. Okay? You are not under the law. What law? Folks, there's a law out there. Everybody thinks law, Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments were written to show the law of, what I'm going to tell you now, sin and death. You see... Adam gave us the law of sin and death in our members, which take us another place. But once we receive Jesus Christ, there's something in our members working. But this is going to resist it. Your unrenewed mind is going to resist your growth in God. So that's why you have to pray. Seek him early so he cuts that back so you don't have those struggles. My goodness, it takes you two hours in the day just to get right so you can work. You got it all wrong. 
Meet with God and let him start conditioning you, getting you ready to snap, 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 move in the spirit like you're supposed to. Not religious. This is not religion. I'm not a religious man. I love God and I have a personal relationship with him. I'm sold out for Jesus Christ. But I don't want to teach you religion. You never know what God's going to... God's putting you through this, sister, to kind of teach you something that you're not aware of yet. All that is a bunch of bunk. And yet 60% of most of the churches are teaching that. They don't know better because they're crossing Old Testament with New Testament. Crossing old. I love the Old Testament. I study the Old Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for reproof, instruction in righteous men that we be fairly, you know, furnished unto every good work. So we cannot go cross country in a broken car. You need to fly across country in the New Testament belief system. Can you say amen? You have a God who lives in you now. In the Old Testament, they just wished they were in the time that you and I now live. Jesus said it this way. Had they had seen what you see, they would have never treated me so rudely. Hello. You get to see God. You get to behold God. You have God dwelling on the inside of you. Focus, 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 focus on that part. Not what you're doing for God, your relationship with God. Then what you do comes out full and fruitful, and it's a good work. Can you say amen? If not, say oh me. All right, so now it gives us a picture. In Galatians, it gives us a, what I call a snapshot, a picture of what the flesh can do. How many know our flesh can do some pretty nasty things? So we'll just list a couple. I won't read all of this. But if you'll continue to read with me, look at verse 19. Now the works, notice it doesn't say the fruit. It doesn't say fruit. It says what? Right, your flesh wants to do what? Work all the time. Wants to impress people. Wants to show everybody how great you are. Cain wanted to do it his way. A work, 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 work. Hello? The Jews, all they ever did was work. And then they turned around to people and say, you're not working hard enough. Pharisees added to the law. The law states, you can't live up to the demands of God. What should I do? Work harder. No. Surrender and accept Jesus and let him do the work. Can you say amen? Let him do the work, you step back and sit down and let him do the driving. Does that mean I don't get involved? I, I don't do my routines? No. That simply means that he's in charge of your routines and you're going to do it his way instead. Hello. You want to play, you want to do something you've always done and you want it to be better? Let him be in charge of it. He'll, now, you, you're good at something? He'll make you even better. Hello. That's the whole purpose of it to make you so better that everybody wants to have the God you serve. And I, you know, the enemy says, well, I got to stop that right away. So let's get everybody talking about each other and getting all caught up in the negatives and everything like that. And then your flesh grows up and says, nonsense with this. I'm going to do it my way. How many know that doesn't work? Okay. So here's a little glimpse of what the flesh can do. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery. <laughs> That's a good one. Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. I'm going to stop right there. <coughs> Ew. Now, I did this in Bible college. How many of you are in my illustration about speaking to the water? Well, what happens in Bible college when you're having to study themes like for example eschatology the study of man uh, you know um, I mean study the end times of man then anthropology the study of man there's all kinds of stuff but when you're studying sin the teachers would tell you keep the blood on you because you have to study the effects of sin and the next thing it is because we're like a magnet we start drawing that kind of facts so if all you do is study faults and what's wrong with everything, you're going to become wrong conscious. 
and you're going to attract wrong stuff. Have you ever noticed there's some people that it seems like wrong follows them everywhere they go? Because as they sow, so shall they. Yeah. Now, I'm not naming it and claiming all that silly stuff. But what I am saying is, as we sow, so shall we. And as Christians, we learn to cut off all of the bad harvests. Can you say amen? If you said a whole bunch of things you wish you could take back, you can. You can say, God, would you neutralize those words? And please don't let it affect the people that heard that. I'm sorry. So does that license you to go out there and do it again? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know, but several times I've stuck my foot in my mouth. I felt so embarrassed. So now you see what the flesh can do without God. Adultery, fornication, all that kind of stuff. Also, folks, listen, Christians can allow themselves to get this bad where they compromise so much. Don't do that. If you regularly meet with God every day, like you're supposed to, and get in the Word, just love God and love others, you won't have that situation. But see, a lot of times in, in stresses, stress areas, doctors run off with their, their nurses. You understand? All that happens because of the stress areas are so heavy. God doesn't want us stressed. He wants us blessed. Hello? <laughs> and if we do it his way, little mess in the stress. So you're blessed. Do you understand? And so God, God has a system for you, but we need to learn how to walk in it. Can you say amen? Look at your neighbor and say, hey, we need to learn to walk in it. Okay, so we have a snapshot of the flesh. Now we see a snapshot of the fruit of the Spirit. Go down to verse 22. Verse 22 says, now the fruit of the Spirit is. Notice it doesn't say fruits of the Spirit are. Who's the fruit of the Spirit? Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say Jesus. Jesus can be divided up into fruit portions. Those are fruit portions. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, faithfulness. All are fruit portions of Christ. If Christ is ruling in your life, you're going to be full of love. If Christ is running in your life, you're going to be full of joy. I don't know about you, but sometimes the joy will come on me and I'll start laughing. One time happened in a restaurant. It was wild. Wish you could have been there. <laughs> well, because God wants you full of joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength, right? He wants us full of peace. Folks, it says pursue peace at all times. I could get more done with a, a peaceful attitude than with one stirred up. Who's the Prince of Peace? So these portions, all of them, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Long-suffering doesn't mean suffering long. <laughs> it's an old English word which means that you've got something on the inside of you that will keep you and put you over in life. It's called patience or endurance. Now, folks, when you read James and it says, let patience have a perfect work, James is writing to a bunch of Jews that were backslidden. So you understand the, the history. To the 12 tribes scattered abroad, greeting, you know. And then he's explaining to them, you're giving up God and panicking because somebody's threatening your life. Did you forget the exhortation that God has spoken to you as unto children? And then he says, let patience have her perfect work. And see, that's in Jewish language. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? It would read in the New Testament, let Jesus in you have his perfect work. Who's patience? Look at your neighbor. Jesus is the God of patience. Can you say amen? Is he patient? So we're not trying to be patient. This is the error. We let patience, God, have his perfect work. Instead of panicking, shut the lips, praise the Lord, and let God take you through it. The less you speak, the less trouble you'll get in on the way. All right, let's go past this. We're going to cover these four things. Everyone say, 
Here's what they are. Create, we're going to cover number one, two, three, and four, hopefully. <laughs> Bless your heart. I love you. Notice I didn't have six songs, only had five today. Yep. All right. I just want to get more words in. Uh, my family watches too, so we're just ble blessing them. Okay, we're going to cover these four main areas today. Number one, we're created for good works. We need to get after it. Folks, when I die, what am I going to leave behind? A stain or good works? You need to be thinking about that. Your kids, your grandkids, your great Karen kids, do they see a nice, mellow Christian? Or do they see somebody that's really living it out? You, you decide before God. Right? Amen. Come on. All right. Two, we're going to cover this. It is God who does the work in us. Let him have his way. Christians today, and I know it's, I know it's just, a small, just a small adjustment, but we're working so hard to live up to God. Is that right? Completely error. It's not by works of our own righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. So what the enemy tries to do is lay a trip on us. So if we work harder, pray more, if we, we ask everyone to forgive us, then God will start favoring us. We got it all wrong. God already favored us. The thief is the one running you and running your mind. Hello. He's the one with the carrot, and he's the one with the threats. God says, you be quiet and be still. Know I'm God. Once you know I'm God, I will take over if you allow me to and just follow me. You rest while I fight. You rest while I plow through. You rejoice and have peace while I beat the tar out of the enemy. For in him we live. In him we move. And in him we exist. If you're in the building, where are you? If you're in him, where are you? Well, brother, I don't feel like I'm in him. Feelings. That's your flesh. If you wait for your feelings to feel good, you're going to be way last in line. You get after it because you know it's right. Maturity comes when you do the right thing, even when you don't feel like it. Because it's God. I don't know if I want to go to church. I get up and go to church. Don't talk to me that way, Pastor Kerry. Come on. Your coach in high school talked to you worse than that. What's he sipping on up there? What am I sipping on? See if you got a word of knowledge. What? Instant breakfast. Instant breakfast, yeah. So I have to adjust my eating because of my situation. So if I don't have any food, you're going to see me pass out in front of you. Oh, he was slain in the spirit. <laughs> so I have to get a little nourishment down. I used to fast every Sunday morning so I could get out the message without my flesh hindering it. But now I don't fast every Sunday morning is sort of a semi instant breakfast all right third thing is we're going to show you and talk about we shall know a tree by its fruit folks not everybody that says they're a Christian is if a person is going to be a Christian let the fruit of Christ come forth don't tell everybody what you're going to do for God Satan will make you eat your words. Just simply say, God, and you are right. We're going to do it. Go ahead, and I'll follow you, Lord. <laughs> God will start moving you on the bench. My very first mission trip I went on. Can I tell you a couple minutes? God sent me on a forest fire. I'm only six months old in the Lord. He sent me to eastern Washington in Colville, and the fires are burning every way. They already carried out a dead man. I went there and I says, God, what do you got me on this fire for? And of course, the devil says, he brought you here to teach you a lesson. <laughs> anyway, a lot of people got saved. A lot of people got healed because God says, you keep looking to me and obeying me no matter what you see with your eyes or hear with your ears. And man, 
It'd take me, I don't know, half a day to tell you all that went on. It was amazing. So I don't want to bore you with that because we're also going to cover God rewards loving works. It's called a labor of love. God rewards loving works. Okay, let's get to the first one. We were created for good works. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, this is the New King James, I use that one. For we are his workmanship, or masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. See, we walk in good works. Oh, I know Peggy. She's always doing something good for God. Oh, I know Sherry. She's always doing something good for God. Hello. I'll tell you one person who really does. I, I didn't want to embarrass her, but I will. Linda back there, she really does do many things for God. And she's quiet about it. You see, people that do a lot of things for God, they don't have to brag. It's what they do talks. It's what they do. How they help talks. You say, hello. Amen. I found out every time that I went and kind of bolstered what I can do for Jesus, it usually falls apart. <laughs> All right, move right along with this. Not only that, but listen to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians 1, 6 is being confident of this very thing. What should be confident in? This very next thing. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. You're saved. You've got a good work working in you. But now you need to let it out, inspire everything you do. That Continue to the work in you. Now, do you want that to work faster and take over quicker? How many here would like that? Yeah. Then you need to be more consistent meeting with God. He's the one that grows us up. Remember? Not what we do. Not what we say. Not what we read. What we take to God, he grows us up inside. Okay? That's where you grow. In prayer. That's why Satan tries to keep you out of it. I've never seen so much resistance to prayer in my life. You ask somebody to pray and they go, go pray over the food. How do you exist? You can't talk to God like that. And in front of others, you should be able to talk about that all the time. Everyone say, yeah. yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, straighten up. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hello. Prayer, that's the initial essence of God working in us. All right. A couple of things now. Number one, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. These works are inspired by God and they're the whatsoever. Remember we read that scripture last week? Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. That's what the work of God that you do by inspiration of God lasts forever. St. Jude, Christians, who believed God and prayed that they would be, have a place where people come, they don't have any money, where they could get medicine. Hello? A vision, a work of God. Well, I'm not like that. How do you know? How do you know you're not the next Billy Graham, Billy Sunday? How do you know? You got to get after it. Like Scott says all in motion or you're making just commotion I added to it listen to this it goes on to say the Bible says whatever is born of God overcomes the world we step in time with God in what he told us to do we're then motivated by love to do it and empowered by God to get it done can you say amen wow when God asks me to do something, I know he will empower me to carry it out. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Seth, you're going to Africa. You're going to be a missionary. <laughs> no, God's never going to tell you to get involved in something that you are absolutely clumsy in doing it. It's not that way. God told me I would do some missionary work to teach me about different styles and different cultures of people. I'm glad he did. 
am I supposed to be a missionary all the time? No, I'm supposed to be a pastor. So sometimes we'll experience things that'll be a good for the very calling that we have. Say amen. All right. First Thessalonians, get this one. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 13. Remember, we're studying about being created for good works. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 13 says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which would, <coughs> <clears throat> which you've heard of, uh, from us you welcomed it not as the word of men now this is receiving the word but as it was the truth the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe so here's what happens we go to God and he begins to raise us up within ourselves then we read the word, then we take the word back to God, and then he begins to show us what it really means. I can tell you what the word means, but I want you to take that, go into God, and ask him to give you its personal meaning to you. The word will always mean the same thing, but it has a broad application. For example, God so loved the world. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. God, who is God? So love. What kind of love is that? The world. What part of the world, you see? And sometimes we'll just look at the surface of it, and other times God will bring out the meat of it. But he does that when we're with him. Once in a while, I'll be talking to God and just sharing. No, no big deal. It's just kind of like we're having a little conversation. And he'll show me something. And I'll go, wow. You want to hear the last one he showed me? Real quickly. The Bible says we frame our world by the word of God. We frame our personal world by the word of God. Hebrews chapter 1, I think around verse 3. And then it goes and lists all these people. Enoch and Abraham and Elijah and Moses. They frame their world by the word of God. Let me ask you, don't each one of us have our own doctor? our own dentist don't we go to our own favorite store at least to have it delivered within our own world what we kind of exercise ourselves in is what we go through and, and exchange in every day it's not our own world our social world so we can frame it by speaking the word in that so our world that we had now becomes better because we're framing not only do we have a doctor but we have the best doctor in the west you know not only do we have a good dentist but we have a dentist that's spirit filled because you began to frame it and pray it and asking God to frame your world around you grapes, grapes. do you guys enjoy those grapes uh, if you didn't get any I don't know what to say to you you know but we frame our world it's the it's the spasmatic actions that a lot of us have that we need to get under God. You know what I mean? Get upset and we just go off. That will neutralize all kinds of stuff if you keep that up. Remember, being upset is worse than, for you than it is who you upset at. Don't get upset. Jesus got angry, but he didn't sin, didn't he? He says, you made my father's house a den of thieves. And he overchanged the money. That's as angry as you're ever going to see him. That's the Old Testament. Are you with me? Okay. How many here know it's God who, who does the work in us? So go with me to Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse 12 and 13. God is doing the work in you and I. Now, I'm only going to use the last part of 12. So I got in my notes 12B. <laughs> it's just a little Bible college thing. And it goes on. Here's what it says. It says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? We're not supposed to do the works. It says work out. Work out with who? 
work out with God. Lord, I want to be saved. Lord, I know that I accepted you and, and I know I asked you to come into my heart, but I want you to work out from the inside of me all the good stuff that you want me to know and learn and how that I can do good things for others. Hello. So you talk with God, you fellowship with God on a daily basis, and you and God work out your salvation and makes you secure and quiet from any fear of evil if you let God take over. Now just think about the natural part of that. If you have God in you and God's around you, you're walking with God. Is there anybody going to run, jump in front of you and go, blah, 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 I'm the devil, I'm going to scare you. You're going to laugh. It's ridiculous. It's the Christians who don't pray, don't seek God, and they just somehow stumble on some spirituality, and they're going to church, and they love God, but there is so much of them that's still alive that needs to be dead, and so much more of God in them needs to be in control, that anytime somebody says something or does something, they're always irritated. They're always offended. If I tell you, go get that ladder and bring it to me right now, please don't get offended. There might be a fire. <laughs> People who get offended easily are still babies and they haven't grown. So if that's you, nobody, don't tell anybody. Go to God and he'll go right up out of that. Say amen, somebody. Listen to this next scripture. It says, work out your own salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask. How much can you ask for? Ooh. Or think. Wow. Ask or think according to the power that works where? Yeah. So imagine you got God in here in seed form. So when you go to God, you bring God, you're a vessel, you're carrying God to God. Now you're in the presence of God, and God germinates the seed. He grows the seed up. He develops that seed. And now Christ begins to form in you, and you begin to change and die out, and Christ begins to take over. Hello. But that will not happen if you do not consistently Get God in you soaked with the God that you're visiting on a face-to-face -face relationship. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that gets pushed to the side. And only once in a while when you get happy or go around and everybody's doing a praise and compliment that that rises up. No, no. You should be happier than the lark, full of the joy of the Lord, right in the middle of a storm. Because God doesn't move on physical things. And neither should we. Remember the guys in the boat? Hey, guys, go over to the other side. I'll see you in a while. Jesus talking, I'm paraphrasing. So they got in the boat, went, and a big old storm came. And then they see Jesus walking down the water. Wah! It's a ghost. You know? But think about that. And I can understand, finally Jesus gets to the boat, gets in, and he causes the water to be mellow. But in the New Testament, Jesus is in our boat. He's in your heart. He's asleep in the pillow until you wake him up. <laughs> Why is he asleep in the pillow? Because he knows it's finished. He knows it's finished, and if you will trust him, he will carry you all the way to heaven. If you will trust him and obey him, he'll get you to heaven. Can you say amen? amen? But don't wander from your guided tour. <laughs> I ever been on a tour and your kid wandered away? <laughs> we have a lot of wandering Christians. They can't stay with one church. They're paranoid about things. They hear something and this and this. And what happens, we're not settled. We're not rooted and grounded. We're, we're still wander. We're still distracted easily. We don't need to be that way. Can you say amen? All right. So, for this reason, I thank God without ceasing that when you receive the word of God, it is God works working in you. All right, let's go to the next one. We can know a tree by the what? Listen, if I plant a orange tree, I'm not going to find cotton on it. Hello? 
And if I plant a peach tree, I'm not going to find apples on it. So what people don't realize is the Bible says we're like trees. Everyone say, I, I thought it was. <laughs> You're like a tree. And in this way, you grow four ways. You grow high, breadth, depth, and length. Hello. Christians do the very same thing. You grow in your spirituality, you grow in your character, you grow in your stability, and you grow in your endurance. Hello. You grow like a tree. So with a tree, there's fruit, some kind of fruit, maybe seed or whatever. But let's picture it. The Bible says that Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the every branch in me that bears much fruit. He what? He prunes it. Why would he prune the ones that are bearing much fruit? Because it will bear more fruit. So what he prunes in your life is what he tells you to act and believe. He doesn't whack your flesh and paddle your buns. <laughs> That's not him trimming you. Hello? Well, yeah, there's snip and then the branch falls out. The way God does it is he prunes you supernaturally. The branch doesn't go out. It's not under the curse. Can you say amen? He develops you wholly and completely. Say amen. But you should recognize that not everybody says something is actually who they say. You should know a person by their fruit. Somebody says, you know, I love you, and then they turn around cursing you. You know them by their words? Do you know them by their works? You know them by their fruit. Fruit. Who's the fruit? So if you do a work, in the work that you do should be Jesus. Can you, it should be fruitful. There should be joy in your working. You shouldn't work at the church cursing the pastor. Nobody does, so I can say that. Hello? Resenting it. Listen, God wants you to usher. Don't complain. The moment you do, you won't get one reward for that. Every time we complain about our life, all the rewards are gone, and now we have to start over. Now, I just said rewards. Oh, sure, Pastor Kerry. Hey, follow with me here. God wants us to have good rewards. I, mean, I could hear the TV echoing in there. Okay. Are you with me? So you know a tree by the fruit. Look at what Matthew chapter 12, 33 and 37 says. If you can get those doors closed, that would really wouldn't bug me. All right. So it says, either make the tree good or and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. What is he talking about? Well, first of all, there's two different kinds of believers. There's the Jews who believe in works, and then God will set them by their works. And then there are those that believe in faith and by their fruits. Hello. Okay. Now listen to what this says. It really defines it for us. Either make the tree good. How do we make somebody good? Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sin. He's talking to the Jews. He says, you want to do good, but all you're doing is picking on people. You're setting up rules they can't follow. You're cursing them, kicking them out of synagogues. He says, you gotta, if you're going to produce good fruit, you got to make the tree good. So we have to accept Jesus. That's the only goodness that we have. And he inspires the goodness that we do. Can you say amen? So it goes up further. Brood of vipers, he says. How can you being evil speak good things? Good question. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth slippeth. Speaks. For a good man out of the good treasure of his heart will bring forth what? Good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart will bring forth... Yeah, somebody could say I'm a Christian, but why are you they pounding and they're angry all the time? Their fruit does not prove it out. Okay, look at the fruit. Don't judge them. Look at the fruit. If I reach into a, an orchard for a nice, luscious apricot or a fruit, and all I get is a crab apple, you will know a tree by its fruit. Uh, don't put people who are not ready in positions of authority because they'll produce the wrong kind of fruit. 
get them trained up and help them to do it, and then back them. Can you say amen? All right, so then he goes on and he further says, a good man out of the good treasure that I bring forth good thing. Then he goes on, verse 37, for by your words you are justified, and by your words you are what? Watch what you say. Always watch what you say. Does your opinion about our government need to really be spoken in the ears of those who don't need to hear it? Good question. But you know, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> You're all right. <laughs> Are you with me? All right, listen to this now. But I say to you that every idle word that a man shall speak will give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Ooh, what's an idle word? Doesn't go anywhere. You want to shoot the breeze? Make sure it's got Jesus in it. <laughs> Hello. It's kind of like the three uh, guys got together. You know, and they were all together and after work and everything, and they always have a bite of sandwich and, and a little drink afterwards and not, not booze. And they're sitting around talking, and the first guy says, yeah, I got to confess. We go to the same church, but I got to confess. I got a couple of faults that I have, you know. And he says, one, I just don't like the way the pastor laughs. He's got this weird, whacked out laugh, just kind of hideous. And the other guy says, you think that's funny? You know, the other day, the pastor went into the restroom they didn't turn off his mic and they fired the sound man Ooh, I'm just making this stuff up okay and the third and they looked at the third guy and he says hey what's your fault he says I, I, I don't want to tell you oh come on tell us we told you ours he says well I'm sort of the church gossip and I can't wait to get home on the phone So we really do have to watch how we talk, if it's edifying, how we're coming across the others. Very important. Because who are we? We're trees of righteousness. We're God's children. Say amen. amen. And every word we speak, you're kicking, uh, you're kicking things around and you're, you're saying something rude to your wife. Every idle word. So, so guess what? You don't have to defend yourself. They're already in trouble. Just say, God... Let them see what they're doing is not correct. And God, their father, will go in and take care of it. I love my father doing the work so I don't get caught up in the mess. Are you with me? And then it goes on further to say, it says, by your words, you're justified. So, did you know you can control where you're going by the words of your mouth? It says your mouth is like a rudder. It's like a steering wheel. You want to go left? Talk left. You want to go right? Talk right. Now listen, there's a bunch of weird stuff about the name it and claim it group. That's not what I'm talking about. We frame our world by the words of our mouth. Let me explain. If I say dog to you, everyone close your eyes. If I say dog to you, you're going to get a picture of a dog, right? Somewhere in your thinking. If I say black dog, it's going to narrow it down. If I say Labrador black dog, then you're going to see the dog. That's what the Word of God does. Gives us narrow, godly views of reality. Can you say amen? Pictures for us to see the way God set things up. Can you say amen? But if we just willy-nilly talk and throw things out, you're never going to have a victorious, powerful life. Why? Because there's too much shortage. You're shorting out the power of God by all no control of your lips and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm not talking about legalism here. I'm talking about a lifestyle of that kind of discipline. Say amen. amen. So you know a tree by the what? So if somebody tells you I love you and then they're stabbing you in the back, you know they're just full of it. <laughs> Let's go to our third point. Our third point, our last point, I mean, is God rewards the faithful. Did he get all three? Now I go to fourth. God rewards who? Faithful. Okay. You want to know what pastors are sticklers about coming to church? Because the Bible warns us that it's a commandment not to forsake ourselves from assembling ourselves together as some other people have. But as much more, he says, see the day approaching, gather, gather so we can get training. We're strong in numbers. Can you say amen? But I want to let you know something. God will never be indebted to you. 
If you do a good work for somebody, God will see that you're repaid. You know, you might not ask for it. I'm not given to get, see, I'm not talking about that. But when you do good works and you love people and you do things, God gives back to you because he will not be in debt to humanity. Do you understand that? So he repays. Says he that lends to the poor lends to the Lord and God says, I will repay you. So we know there are rewards coming for everything that we do. So we should know what they're for and how to get them. Because it all says when we get up before God, God is going to reward us by our works. So we want them to be good. Say amen. Catch this. Go with me to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to look at 40 through 42. It says, he who receives me and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Whoa. He who blesses or receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man what? Reward. Like you have an option. Let's see, such a chef ministry. And you heard some of the people in the ministry are not doing the right thing. So you have one or two things you can do. Lord, I bless that ministry or I criticize that ministry. Which one do you think God's going to talk to me about? He's going to get on my case for criticizing them. But he wants me to bless them. What does the Bible say blessing is? Blessing is sicking God on somebody with all of his wisdom and knowledge. So it says, bless those that hate you. How many here remember reading that? And thought you'd skip over it. <laughs> that term, bless those that hate you, means that when you bless them, you sick God on them. And God is wise enough to deal with them and turn them around. But if you curse them then the, what you curse them with will come back and attach itself to you. So you want to play the, pray that you got Teflon skin. People call you a name, don't call a name back. Somebody asks you for your cloak, give them whatever else they might want. Why? In so doing, you strip the devil of any power, and you win that person to the Lord. They slap you on the right cheek, turn to them, and what? And people don't understand that because they're not taught. That is not Jesus saying, go ahead and get beat up for his name. <laughs> it's saying the moment you yield, instead of taking matters in your own hands and coming against somebody, tooth for a tooth, eye for an eye, you yield, and God steps in and deals with it. I mean, no, if you've got one angry person coming against you, if you don't enter in, you still have one angry person. But if you enter in and start doing what they're doing, now there's two angry people that God has to deal with. God's no respecter of persons. If you were doing it wrong, he'll talk to you. He has a son, daughter. All right. Listen as I read on. Verse 42, And whoever gives one of these little ones... Only a cup of water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Wow. God says, walk in love, help, do good works. Hello. In so doing, you're sowing and reaping, right? See, before I, oh, I don't want to do a good work to Sherry. She said something about me the other day. That's not what God wants you to do. How do you know? That's not a lie. Sorry, Sherry. Just <laughs> She's always talking. No. You see, instead, we're sowing. We're sowing. Satan can't stop that. He can't stop that. You got an enemy that just hates you. Get him a little gift and send it to him. They love you dearly. And mean it. Mean it. Hello. I have a lot of people who use phrases I appreciate you and that's a good one I love that one I, I'm using it now but really mean it when you say it hello don't just say it you know because the words without spirit there's no life in them just like faith without works is dead 
All right, let me read this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 says, So that neither is he that plants anything or he that waters anything, but it is God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are all of one God. And it says, And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Some of you are going to get a ton of rewards when you get to heaven. Folks, what we think of is really not the truth. The person that is really going to get the rewards for this church is the person that's been praying for it. Not the guy that's up here sharing the word necessarily. Hello, I'm not going to get all the rewards. Uh -uh. It's going to be the people that are doing the labor underneath and out of sight, praying and asking God and sowing good works, giving gifts or buying something and not telling anybody. And slowly it's there and you go, where'd this come from? Good works, you see. Have you ever had a Pentecostal handshake? That's where a guy's got a 10 or 20 bucks in his hand. He says, hey, how you doing? Go have lunch. It's time for us to start opening up and letting God bless us back. For you'll know a tree by its fruit. And you're very fruitful trees, all of you are. You're givers, you're lovers. You forgive easily. You don't hold ought a resentment. Amen. You don't talk about your neighbor. That's who ascends to the holy hill. He with clean hands and a pure heart. Well, if you got something out of this morning, would you give the Lord praise?